Good morning and welcome to worship once again uh, for our online service for St. Peter's Lutheran Church. We're really uh, glad that you're joining us and that we can worship God together um, in spirit and in truth as the body of Christ. We do have a few announcements uh, that I want to make before we get into our worship service. Uh, the first announcement is thank you to everyone who brought stuff for Union Gospel Mission. We had a team that took stuff, uh, Arla Hoagland and Melinda Ryan uh, took stuff over there this past Monday. And I'm sure it was much appreciated. So thank you very much, everyone who helped out. Also, uh, Pastor Eric returns from his vacation tomorrow. Uh, so he'll be back in the office uh, beginning tomorrow, August 3rd. And thank you to everyone who helped out uh, the DePello family as we moved into our new home uh, this weekend as well. We are very, very grateful for our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who continue to uh, just take care of us as a family and uh, be there uh, for us. And so... Uh, thank you very much. A um, couple other quick announcements. First of all, uh, the high school group will go to Rock and Water this week. They'll be leaving on Wednesday and return on Saturday. So please keep uh, them in your prayers. If you're a high school family and you have questions uh, that you still need addressed before we leave for that trip, uh, you can contact uh, Brad Longstreth, our uh, Director of Youth Ministries. We have a new church secretary in the office. Congratulations to uh, Bethany Hiranaka who is uh, joining our team part-time in the front office. We're very thankful for her to be on board, and I'm sure she will be a true blessing uh, to St. Peter's. Um, with that, also Siobhan Berndt, who is, has been our secretary on the school side, um, finished up and has uh, stepped away from that position as of this past uh, Friday. Uh, so thank you to Siobhan uh, for her years of service to St. Peter's Lutheran Church and School and uh, blessings to you as you move on to the next endeavor. Um, there are different ways you can get involved in ministry during this time, uh, including um, ways that you can help people who are vulnerable and at risk. Things like supporting food banks and, and shelters, donating blood, checking in on your neighbors, supporting nonprofits, delivering meals, and so on. If you have ideas, questions about how you might be able to get involved, contact uh, the church office so we can hopefully help out and steer you in the right direction for that and, uh, and encourage you in different ways. Um, we have an adult education class that will be starting in August and it is going to be a YouTube video on Fridays just like we have been doing with Pastor Eric's class um, and then a Zoom conference on Wednesday evenings. The class will be uh, Discipleship in the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be teaching a six-week class on discipleship in the Gospel of Matthew as we explore how Jesus teaches the church, how he teaches us what it means to be a follower of Christ as he uh, has these five different discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. So we're looking at that Gospel as Jesus reminds us that we are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so we'll look at those teachings as we grow as disciples of Christ. So that will begin um, not this coming week, uh, but uh, August 19th, it'll be six weeks, will be the first Zoom meeting. The first video will come out on August 14th, and it will run through September uh, 23rd. So if you want more information about that, you can contact the office or contact me, uh, but we will uh, get information out there soon. Um, I believe those are all of the announcements at this point in time. So uh, if able, please rise for our opening hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment now to confess our sins before the throne of God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake he forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give, th give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. The first reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, beginning at verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Here ends the first reading. Second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Here ends our second reading. At this time, kids can gather around for the children's message.
Good morning once again, and I'm glad to see everybody, even though I can't see you, but I'm glad that we can be together through this, through this means. And uh, today I want to talk about compassion. What is compassion? I don't know what you think about when you think about compassion, um, but I think about um, all of the times that we see Jesus in the Gospels um, show his love to people. We see Jesus raise the son of the widow of Nain because he had compassion on her. We see Jesus feed the 5,000 and heal sick because he has compassion on them. He loves them. He's moved for them. We see Jesus forgive you and me because he has compassion on us. So I want you to think about that word compassion this week. Think about what it means for you. Um, how has Jesus shown you love and compassion? How he has not left you, but um, sent his son to die for you. God sent his son to die for you. I don't know how many of you have hymnals, um, probably not a lot of you, but I want to encourage families this week, um, look up a certain hymn. You can find it online. You can go, uh, you can Google it and find some kind of version of it. But it's a hymn by Martin Luther. It's called Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. In our green hymnal, it's hymn 299. But read through it. It's about eight, nine stanzas. It's kind of a long hymn if you're singing it. But you can just read through it because it talks about the story of God's love and compassion for us. So read through that this, this week. And then think about how Jesus has loved you, what he's done for you. And then take some time, and I want you to do this. I want you to talk as a family and pray about how you might love and show Jesus' love to others. What can you do? I know there's a lot of things that we can't do right now because of, of COVID, but think and pray about how can I be... Um, Jesus' hands and feet and show his love and his compassion to other people that they too might know what Jesus has done for them. So pray about that this week and let's pray now. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. I pray that you um, help us to be your hands and your feet. We thank you for your love and your compassion through Jesus Christ our Lord and I pray that you would uh, help us to uh, show that love and compassion to others. Bless us as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll see you soon. God bless. Once again, please rise if able for the Alleluia verse and the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of our Lord. song is In Christ Alone.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Have you ever been so moved by something you've experienced or a story that you've heard that you could feel it uh, in every fiber of your, of your body? I'm sure you've probably experienced that, at least most of you probably have. And I don't mean a time when you were literally sick to your stomach, and I don't mean any kind of you know, romantic uh, experience, but I'm talking about a time when your heart ached because of a situation, where your stomach uh, turned because of a situation, uh, where maybe even your body shook because of the situation. If you will, I'm really talking about a, a visceral reaction. Uh, where our whole body feels something. I can think of a number of times that I've felt that way in my life and in ministry, but two of them uh, popped into my mind as I was beginning to write on this topic for this sermon. Mind you, I should say that uh, one of the dangers of ministry, though it, though it is a caring ministry, as pastors we're called on to show love and sympathy and to care for others, I'll admit that one of the dangers that I've noticed is that often uh, we get desensitized. Maybe that's not true of every pastor, but it's certainly uh, been true in my life and ministry. We get desensitized. I think it's easy uh, to become a little bit like uh, doctors or nurses or maybe certain other professions where you see a lot and it starts to fail to affect you. And I'm very mindful of that as I've seen some horrendous things, suicides. I've watched uh, people die sitting in the hospital with them. I've watched people literally get cremated as I've sat there as it happens. And sometimes I've asked myself, why did I handle that so well? Why did I handle that okay? Why did I not have this visceral uh, reaction? Shouldn't I have felt more? Anyway, the two times that come to my mind for some reason as I was sitting down to write, uh, both of these times actually happened before I was uh, an ordained pastor. The first one when I, was when I was working uh, assets protection uh, at, for Target in Irvine while I was in college. And we had just arrested a kid, uh, probably somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. I don't recall exactly how old he was. Uh, for stealing, he had, he had stolen a stack of, of CDs. You know, he had them in his pants and in his waist and all kinds of uh, places in order to walk out of the store with all of these CDs and we had apprehended him and his older cousin was outside of the store and had put him up to it and we had to call the cops of course and not only did we have to call the cops but because he's a minor uh, we had to call his mom and uh, we couldn't get a hold of his mom we had no way of getting a hold of his mom and he couldn't give me a way to call his mom this is like 2001 and not everyone was walking around with smartphones uh, and we couldn't get a hold of his mom and he couldn't give us a way to call his mom because he said that his mom had to get rid of their phone line at home uh, in order to get a new TV for his dad's prison cell. And when Irvine uh, PD got there, they walked into the room and they saw his name and said, hey, do you live at such and such a place? And the kid said, yeah. And they said, oh yeah, we remember you. We arrested your daddy. And there was something about uh, his uncle as well, who had died or been arrested as well because of his illegal activities. And I remember just sitting there and as they said, we arrested your daddy, my heart just sunk for this kid. I went from being fairly proud of a good apprehension to just hurting for this kid. What hope did he have? Who was going to show him the right path? He was set up for failure by every role model in his family. And my body was just moved as I hurt for this kid. So that's one of the times I could think of this kind of reaction physically. I could think of lots of them, but it's one of the times. The other time, I'll keep it kind of short, but the other time was when I was a vicar uh, at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Napoleon, Ohio. And I received a call about a young family who were at the children's hospital uh, in Toledo with their youngest, Natalie, uh, who was one years old. And I went to visit them and I sat in the room with them and we talked uh, about what was being said, about what kind of tests they were running and all of those kinds of things. 
And while I was still sitting there in the room with them, the doctor came in and he told them the news uh, that they were not prepared to hear. Natalie had leukemia. And I sat there and I watched this family break down before uh, my eyes. And I sat there helpless and not having anything that I could possibly do uh, to change this situation. And my stomach turned and was in knots and my heart broke for them as they coped uh, with that news. I think once I finally left the room, um, I got back in my car and just sat there in the parking garage and cried. And I remember driving the 45 minutes back home and as soon as I got inside of the house, I remember picking up Lily, uh, who was the exact same age as Natalie, and just holding her and not wanting uh, to let her go. Anyway, I tell you all of that to tell you this, this, this funky word in your bulletin for the sermon title, splunknitsomai, is a Greek word that talks about this feeling, this reaction. And it means that to be moved in your inner parts, literally to have your bowels move, not a bowel movement, but to have your bowels move, your, um, your whole body, your lungs, your heart, your kidney, your liver, your body reacts, your guts react, if you will. And in our text today, and in many parts of the Gospels, we hear this word, and it's translated in this simple way, compassion. Our Gospel today tells us the story that I think we're probably fairly familiar with, the feeding of the 5,000, and we've probably preached on it many, many times here. But we're told in that story, in Matthew 14, that Jesus had compassion on the people. Just to set the stage a little bit, this wasn't just any day that Jesus performed this miracle. But you might notice that our reading picks up at verse 13 today with these words, Now when Jesus heard this, well, heard what? Well, Jesus had just heard about the death, the beheading of John the Baptist. This is the context of the feeding of the 5,000. And remember, of course, that John the Baptist was the forerunner to Jesus, the one who would go and prepare the way for the Messiah. But he wasn't just that. He was a relative of Jesus, as their mothers Mary and Elizabeth were related, if you recall how we're uh, told about the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus in the Gospel, especially the Gospel of Luke. And we all know that in time of loss, when we're dealing with the pain and grieving, losing a loved one, we tend to withdraw a little bit. And that's exactly what Jesus attempts to do. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, that is, heard that news, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. He was going off to be alone. Not uncommon for him, as he often will go off alone to pray. So he's going off alone to pray, to as he's grieving. But when the crowds heard it, it says, they followed him on foot from the towns, and when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. So he's grieving, and he withdraws to be alone in order to pray. But there is no alone time. The people come, and we're told that he had compassion on them. He was moved for them. In his innermost being, he was moved for them. Despite his pain, despite his loss, he had splunkanitsomai, compassion. Compassion seems like such a plain word in English. Not that we don't understand the power of it, but to hear it, we don't necessarily think of a whole body movement, yearning to care for the people. We might think of something a lot lighter. But Jesus is moved for these people, even in his time of grief. And we see this over and over again in the Gospels when it comes to Jesus. In fact, it's a word that's used often for the work that Jesus does. We see in Luke 7, verse 13, as Jesus sees the, uh, the widow of Nain uh, grieving over the death of her only son. And Jesus has compassion on her. He's moved for her, and he raises her son back to life. In Matthew 9, we're told that Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel and healing diseases and affliction. And when he sees the crowd, he has 
compassion on them. He's moved for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And we see it used as Jesus performs a number of other healings for people uh, for whom he was moved for, he was moved for them in his innermost being, his guts, his stomach turned for him, for them. And here in our gospel today, we see the compassion of Jesus as he's moved by this crowd. He heals their sick, even though he himself was in need of rest and solitude. He has compassion on them and he heals their sick. And it appears uh, to go on presumably for hours to the point where he is probably exhausted. We forget sometimes that though he's the almighty uh, son of God, uh, sinless, omnipotent, and knows all things, he also became man taking on the form of a servant. And he too grew tired and weary. He too suffered pain and loss. So it goes on for hours, he's likely exhausted, and it gets to the point uh, where it's evening and his disciples come to him and they tell him to send the people away because it's getting late, it's a desolate place, and they need to go and find food for themselves. And Jesus, in his compassion, in his love for the people, he says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And you know uh, the rest of the story. And I don't want to minimize that part of the story at all, but we've preached on it uh, numerous times. But Jesus takes five loaves of bread and two fish. He blesses them, breaks the bread, gives it to his disciples, and, and the crowd is fed. 5,000 men are fed, plus women and children. It's this amazing, miraculous feeding, a compassionate feeding. By Christ in his love for the people. Not simply to demonstrate his power, which I think is sometimes what we make of such a feeding, but to demonstrate his love and compassion for these people and to show them where true sustenance and satisfaction are found. So he feeds them, he nourishes them, he provides for them, and he satisfies our needs of body and soul. For he is the true bread that has come down from heaven that gives life to the world, as we hear after the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And this compassion and this feeding points us forward, forward to his ultimate act of compassion for humanity, for you and for me, as he lays down his life for us. And he points us to that, to that sustenance, that uh, that nourishment that he continually, continually gives to us through an even more miraculous meal. Yes, an even more miraculous meal than the feeding of the 5,000 as he feeds us and nourishes us through his word and through his very body and blood for our forgiveness and strength that we might taste and know true satisfaction. I'm reminded of one of the great hymns of Luther. It's a hymn, you can look it up. If you have a green hymnal, it's hymn 299. It's Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. And the fourth and fifth stanzas say the following words. It said, But God had seen my wretched state before the world's foundation, and mindful of his mercies great, he planned for my salvation. He turned to me a father's heart. He did not choose the easy part but gave his dearest treasure. And then the fifth stanza says, God said to his beloved son, it's time to have compassion. Then go bright jewel of my crown and bring to all salvation. From sin and sorrow set them free. Slay bitter death for them that they may live with you forever. It's time to have compassion. This is... The way it's described as we see God send forth his Son. We hear those words of John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God was moved for the world that he sent his Son 
to save us. God, in his compassion, in his moved uh, heart for us, and in his agape love for us, does not leave us in our helpless state. He does not leave us in this place where we are sheep without a shepherd. He does not leave us in this place where we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but he comes to us, and in his compassion, in his love for us, he saves us. He rescues us from that wretched state that we were living in. He saves us. He heals us, much like he healed those people at the, in that crowd as he feeds the 5,000. He healed them in his love, in his compassion, and he heals us. What does he heal us from? He heals us from sin and death and all infirmities. Not that every ailment that comes in this world uh, is dealt with and healed immediately. But in his love and compassion, he has dealt with them all permanently. For he has bore our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He has taken on all of our iniquities, our infirmities. He has gone to the cross for us. And by his wounds, we are healed. In his love and compassion, he has brought healing to all mankind. Healing for those who believe in him. That there might be a time when every pain and sorrow that we've experienced in this life might be done away with. When he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, where behold, he'll make all things new. Because in his compassion, he has died so that we might live. He's had compassion on us. He loves us. I even think about another time we hear that word compassion in the Gospels. It's in Matthew chapter 18 in that story of uh, the unforgiving servant. And we know one of those characters in that story is God. And that is this king who um, is owed this incredible amount of money. But in his compassion forgives the person. That's our God. Even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, even though we could not do the things necessary to please him and merit any kind of salvation, in his love and his compassion, he has forgiven us. In his innermost being, he has been moved for us and for our salvation that he sent his only begotten son of this world and in his ultimate act of compassion and love died for us. Gave up all, as I mentioned last week. So know the compassion of Jesus, that he was moved for those people and he fed them and nourished them. And know the compassion of Jesus, that he was so moved for you that he bled and died and gave his very body and blood to feed and nourish you and give you life and salvation. That's good news. The compassion of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And brothers and sisters, though, I'd like to end with that gospel. And I hope you hold on to that gospel of our Lord who has loved us and had compassion on us and feeds us and nourishes us with his word and with his sacrament. I hope it also stirs up our hearts to have a heart like Christ, to love like he has loved us, to have compassion for others, not just warm, fuzzy feelings for others and, oh, and sympathy and, oh, that's too bad. But pray, Lord, just as you have had love and compassion on me, a wretched sinner who doesn't deserve your grace, who was desperate and in need of help, and whom you have loved and cared for and provided for and sustained physically and spiritually and given me life everlasting, Lord, stir up my heart that I might have love and compassion for this world too. I might have love and compassion. Give me that movement, that heart, to care for others the way you have cared for me. Lord knows that we have a world that is still harassed and helpless, assaulted by the evil one, assaulted by the lies of this world and are like sheep without a shepherd, dead in their trespasses and sins. And they need to know about a God who loves them, 
who is so moved uh, in love by them, in love for them, that he came and bled and died for them. So Lord, give us this heart of compassion. Move our hearts that we might show them your heart, the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through your church, Lord, be at work. Through your church, Lord, may we be your hands and your feet, feeding and nourishing others through your gifts, through your word, through your food, this sustenance which does not perish but endures unto eternal life. Be at work among us, O Lord. Stir us up, transform us, and use us in Jesus' name to have compassion for his world. Amen. Once again, please rise if able and let's join together confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Along with those listed in the prayer box will be including um, Inga Biggs, who had surgery this past Friday uh, for her brain aneurysm, uh, Diego Duran, who had oral surgery, Gwen Duran, um, who has been dealing with strep, strep throat and viral infection, and uh, Rod Juan, um, who has been hospitalized as well, and Ron Edwards. Father, we have sought meaning, comfort, and sustenance from all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be turned to your word, that we may hunger for your Son's body and blood and be nourished by your truth. Help us to be satisfied, O Lord, by your word and by your gifts. Keep us, Lord, in your truth and from all error. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks that you have blessed us beyond what we deserve and given to us your church. Guard her life by your spirit and strengthen her witness before the nations. Bless pastors and church workers and all who serve in the body of Christ. And bless those considering and preparing for church work and missionary work. And all those as they witness in their vocations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we too quickly focus on what we lack and not upon your unlimited grace. Bless all relief agencies and services of your church on behalf of the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, and those who have lost hope. Bless those visited by disaster and tragedy, and open our hearts to have compassion on them, to be moved by their needs and moved by the love of Jesus Christ, to help them in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we are daily blessed to know abundance and freedom. Bless those who defend us from our enemies, who serve us in government, and who protect us in our communities. Be with our president, the Congress, our governor, and our judges and magistrates, that they may discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we suffer with all manner of ills and afflictions. Hear us and grant healing according to your will, strength in time of trial and peace at the last. We pray especially for Jesse Monroe, Chris Brace, Carol Manisto, Gloria Doyle, Ron Clark, Jesse Monroe, Ron Edwards, Elaine Staggs, Karen Ingalls, Life Zachariasen, Rod McCarley, Don Yant, Marion Connolly, Allison Lowell, Diane Smith, Lee Salo, Mercedes Whitmire, Jay Ferguson, Rod Juan, Gwen Duran, Diego Duran, Inga Biggs, and all those who we now lift up to you in our hearts.
Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Grant us eyes to see your mercies new every morning and grateful hearts that what we have received we may share with those in need and generously support the work of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we remember the saints who lived by your mercy and died in Christ. We long for that day when all divisions will end and the church in heaven and on earth shall be one in your presence, singing your praise in your kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we ask you to grant us all things needful and to keep us from all things harmful to us and to our salvation, for we trust in your wisdom and your love. Teach us to pray without fear, thy will be done. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction, the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's join in our closing hymn, Crown Him.